where we are right on the coast. So we've got the marshland out here in the wash. And you can even hear. You can hear all the ducks, the geese, all the birds, all along our coastline here. This was actually the new seawall because all the farmland on the left here was all reclaimed off the marsh many years ago. And I've seen the water level on this bank up here within you know, a millimetre or two of coming over the top of the bank. And you suddenly realise, you know, those extreme events are going to happen more and more in the future. And, and also how low-lying, particularly this part of East Anglia, all is. It could really very drastically change. We'll lose the whole lot and, and, and it will sweep in and stay. You know, when sea levels rise, it will stay. It will not go back out again, like everyone thinks it would, you know, be a flood. And you'll lose the wildlife habitats here, you'd lose the farming, you'd lose the communities. It's in everyone's interest that we protect these sorts of areas. We have to get on top of the climate change issue. If the planet's glaciers continue to melt, a quarter of the world's population would lose access to fresh water. A lot of people in cities around the world are used to just turning the tap on and having instant water. Yeah. Yeah. Forgetting, you know, this is where it comes from and this is how we have to manage it. This yeah. is where, you know, if this goes wrong up here, we lose all our water. Very right, because our cities are expanding and the natural availability of water is not good enough to sustain that big population. It takes the story, doesn't it, away from just being about the environment and climate change, but it takes it into people's homes. And actually, this is about water. This is something about yes, there is water. Yeah, exactly. It's about survival. survival. That's the thing, isn't it? Survival, exactly, it's because that the is their lifeline. Mm. Because these glaciers provide water in spring and summer period where we have no rainfall. I heard that you are a geographer by training. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Yeah. Warren, my geography uh, <laughs> teacher, will be well impressed on the back of the glacier after all these years. And we'd love to come and show our children environments yeah. like this. You can impress George <laughs> with saying, your geography knowledge. Finally, my geography <laughs> chat about terminal moraines is useful. I've been you know, given ridicule about it for years, and now I can actually talk to a professor about <laughs> it. And he's like, oh, you know what a moraine is. That's good news. What is going on here is climate change. And 1.6 billion people depend on this fresh water. That is a huge amount of the world's population. You know, imagine if this goes. It's a, it's a huge environmental and humanitarian disaster. And yet, we still don't seem to be picking up the pace and understanding it quick enough. And I think the young are really getting it. And the young generation are really wanting more and more people to do stuff and want more action. And we've got to speed the pace up. We've got to get on top of it and we need to be more more vocal and more educational about what's going on. You find bugs? That's taller than Buckingham Palace. Is this, is this Buckingham Palace? Yeah, yeah. do you like me and Daisy's give you the tour? Oh, you've done it like that? Buckingham Palace, I love it. <laughs> is that the Queen Bee? Very good. We've made all different sections where like, animals go. So this is where we put like the slugs. Like at the top, we've got grass. That's where the worms live. Oh, look at that worm! You know, they don't like being in your hand because the heat. Yeah. Why are bees so important? They bring life to our earth and they help other animals, like the caterpillars. If there was no nature, no bees, no food, no us. Very important. I've got a few questions for you. Have you? Okay, ask me questions. Is Princess Charlotte cheeky than, than Prince George? No, they're about as cheeky as each other. <laughs> they're very cheeky. This is a lovely lady, this one. This is Deborah. I like Deborah a lot. I've never known a rhino be called Deborah before. Now I've got George, Charlotte, and now Louis. Your outlook does change. And that's why I had to do something, because I really felt that by the time my children were 20, at the rate the poaching was at, there may not have been another rhino in the wild. They are a prehistoric, odd-looking creature. But when you get to see their characters and you get to see the family bond they have with their mum, it does make you feel like you're watching a really close family unit. And the fact that they're under so much threat is really quite sad. People might think, oh, it's a big tank, a big hulk of an animal with a big horn. But they are incredibly vulnerable. They don't have brilliant eyesight, and people will take advantage of that. And they want this horn, which is effectively nail. You know, I and mean, that is all it is, it's, it's fingernail. This is where the horn belongs, on, on, the, on a live rhino. And that's where it should stay. Mm. Mm. Yes, 
Excellency Honorable Minister, you are welcome to our library. It's just a, it's a mind-blowing number of tusks. It really is. I can headline it. In this, in this warehouse alone, we have around 43,000 pieces. It's a, it's a really weird feeling. It's kind of um, when you try and visualize how many elephants were attached to these tusks, that's when it gets really quite scary. I've never seen anything quite like it. <laughs> 